In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Last time we started the epistle to the um, Philippians, chapter 1. Um, I'll just give you a quick review. Uh, we talked about the epistle to the Philippians, that it is an epistle of joy. The main topic is around joy. Uh, and we differentiated between happiness and joy, and we talked about that happiness mostly comes from outside, the conditions that make me happy. Versus joy, it's, it's, it's an internal state of being. Uh, it does not really depend on the conditions outside. It does not depend on what people say or do but it depends mostly on my direction in life and my relationship with my God. Joy is dependent on really where my heart is. Um, we spoke about um, four ways to have joy in our life from chapter 1, and it was very clear. We spoke about um, knowing whom I believe. If I believe in a person, my happiness will be dependent on that person, and my knowledge of that person is never complete. People our people. Uh, our, our human condition makes us vulnerable, makes us hurt each other, um, betray each other. Um, so, but knowing whom I believe gives me trust in my God, faith in God that I will not be forsaken. Even if people turn their back on me, God is faithful. He doesn't change. That's why to have joy is mainly because I know where my trust is. I'm not waiting for someone to make me happy. I'm not waiting for a relationship or a condition or something to happen in order for me to make me a better person. I am already loved. I already know my value in my God. I know whom I believe. And number two, um, we spoke about, if you remember, St. Paul was in prison and he, there were some groups, groups, continued to be loyal to him, and other groups went in their own way, but both were preaching Christ. And as we have in the church different schools of thought, different ways of serving, different preachers, different orientations of uh, uh, how church and what a church should be, um, we can have different differences in how we serve. But at the end, if the name of Christ is glorified and is really well served, this is what really makes us happy. So number two, that it is not about my way. It's, it is not about me as long as Christ is glorified. <clears throat> and number three, uh, um, I am free from everything. I'm not, my happiness and my joy is not tied to a certain condition. And we brought the verses that St. Paul said that um, for me to live is Christ, and if I die, is, it is a gain. So whether living or dying, I am in Christ, I am for Christ, therefore I am free, healthy, sick, rich, poor, married, not married, uh, um, 
employed, not employed, living or dying, I am free. Nothing is really pulling me down. My existence and my status and my value is in Christ. Not because I am in a certain position or, or in a certain condition. So whether living or dying, I am for Christ. And then number four, um, we spoke about understanding suffering. And suffering is really the opposite of joy. But again, I rejoice because I understand, not because something is happening from outside, not because I am better than other people. And the last verse I can read again for you is that in chapter 1, verse 29, for you it has been granted or it has been given as a gift on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. So the gift is not only the gift of faith, but on top of that, it, it has been gifted, granted to us that we can suffer also for His sake. And for the normal person, how come you tell me to expect to suffer and have joy? Well, this is for the person who lacks the knowledge of Christ, but for the person who knows, who understands how God works in the world, how God works in my life. Um, yes, I can react to suffering. Yes, nobody loves to suffer. But when I suffer, I can have this understanding that I know what God is doing in my life. God is trying to return me to that original image. And I think I told you this uh, um, analogy of Parents, when they try to teach their children, their babies, how to walk, and they stand a little uh, step in the back, and the child looks at them crying, thinking that their parent has betrayed them or has left them. But matter of fact, if the parent, the parent has to step back for for a while in, in order for the child to learn how to walk. And as, as soon as the child starts walking, both can be happy. Both are rejoicing because this is really an, an achievement. But it started by suffering. It started by, by the child feeling that his dad or mom left him, betrayed him. For the past year, you've been carrying me, you've been cuddling me, and now you're leaving me? Well... <laughs> I want you to grow. Expect that if we continue with this analogy, if you are like 20, 30 years and old and you're still being cuddled by your parents, <laughs> being carried by your parents, and, you, and you, you don't know how to walk because your parents love you, right? And you feel loved. but. Would this be normal? A 20 years old person? No, this is sick. So now what was nice and cuddly and comfortable back then when you were a child, if you don't grow, you'll become sick. So suffering is not really a bad word. It is a bad word for people who want to be cuddled all the time and stay babies in life. But 
for those who want to grow, who welcome God's hand to work in them, yes, they can react to suffering with the human feelings, and it is natural. However, with the feelings comes understanding, and this is joy, this is rejoicing. So by now, I hope that you will understand the difference between joy and happiness. Joy is not jumping from and smiling and, 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 and just looking like the people in magazines and in TV commercials. Happiness, yes, it, it comes from things outside that makes me happy for some time, but then I go home and I'm the same person. Nothing has changed. I just change the conditions outside. I changed the surroundings, and the surroundings made me smile for some time, but it's an external smile. And I go home, I'm stuck with the same person again. <laughs> but joy is, 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 is the internal condition of understanding myself, my God, and my life. This is joy. In chapter 2, he continues to speak about joy, but really not in the way we understand it as humans. He talks about humility. And to us, humility is not really parallel to, to, to joy, but we will read. Chapter 2. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. He said that try to reevaluate how you how you receive joy and comfort and consolation. For the person who gave his or her life to Christ, really, truly, not just um, outwardly or not just in a hypothetical way, God, I give you my life. No, for the person who really gives God and surrenders their life to Christ, um, the consolation that they, they receive the comfort they receive, they get it from Christ, from loving. Loving God and loving one another. If any fellowship of the Spirit, okay, this will bring us to some side talks here, but we seek to spend good time with each other. If we are people of the kingdom, if you are people of God who take communion, who unite with God every Sunday, um, this unity is like marriage. Communion is like marriage. So every time you are taking communion, you are being married again or renewing your vows of marriage with Christ because He is the bride, uh, He is the groom, and we are the church, His bride. So. The way we socialize, the way we have fellowship with each other, should be also in the spirit, should go along with the same path that we chose when we got married to Christ. Again, if, if a married couple here, um, it, it will be not as normal if the husband stays at home uh, and the wife leaves him to have some social hour in some place with other people, totally different way of living. The couple should be together, and the couple should be living in harmony. That's why if any fellowship is in the spirit, how you spend your time, your brothers and sisters in Christ 
will determine the amount of joy versus happiness. Happiness is when we spend time having fun like the world have fun. Uh, and it is not wrong, it is not wrong, but which way will build my spirit? Which way will build my soul? When we get together in social times, in parties, in graduations, in just getting together, how do you spend your time? Do you spend in fellowship as the people of the kingdom? Yes, we will eat, we will laugh, we, we can sing, we can do whatever, but there is a missing part. Where is the spirit in our gathering? Do we pray together? Do we have the guts to tell each other, hey, since we're gathered, let's pray, let's experience the fellowship of Christ? Because look at every gathering you have went, you've gone to so far. Um, you spend a nice time just in that time period, and then you go home and you say, so what's next? What's next? Again, I'm still stuck with the same person. I still feel alone. And, and even if we are around many people, you can still feel that you are alone. But if you spend your time in the Spirit, in fellowship of the Spirit, you start to have this bond of the Spirit, bond of love, bond of really being a community, a member of the body of Christ. That's why here joy comes from spending time in fellowship with my brothers and sisters, loving them in the Spirit. If any affection and mercy, are you merciful to one another? Even the way we gossip, the way we talk about each other, do we extend mercy or do we quick to declare judgment and we seek to hear stories and what this person did, what this person said, oh yeah, they shouldn't have said so, and we start a whole litany of, of judgment and con do we extend mercy? Do I have an eye that is merciful? When you see someone committing a sin or hear about someone who has not doing good, what is the first thought? Oh, look at this bad person, I knew it. Or do you lift up your heart and pray for that person and he needs mercy as well as I need mercy. Because when we say, Father, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who, who trespass against us. So c can we ask for mercy for those people? Because I need mercy too. Because if you spend your time judging other people, would you have joy? You might have fun gossiping or judging other people because you will feel that you are better than them. Look at those bad people, I am better. So this is the temporary happiness. You will feel that you're better. But joy, I doubt. Joy comes from mercy, being merciful. Let nothing in verse uh, 3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or con conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. It's hard, right? <laughs> to esteem each other better than myself. But again, if you remember chapter 1, because it's not about me and I am free from the value, judgment of the world. When you are free, when life is not just about you and your way and how to get better than other people, 
you will be free to have mercy on them and you will be free to consider them better than yourself. This person really has their eyes fixed on Christ. But if, you, if your eyes are fixed on you and on how much better or worse you are than other people, you will never have joy. You will never have this peace because you'll always be looking who is better, who is worse than me. And then your happiness will be conditional upon people. That's why for, for the person who really their eyes are fixed on Christ, they have mercy. They consider each other better than themselves and they do nothing out of ambition or selfish ambition. Yes, we can have a good ambition when I try to succeed, to, to do better, to, to do well, to go beyond my expectations of myself. But if, if I have selfish ambition to step on other people and show them who I am and show them how they are, this is not the good way. <laughs> In verse 4, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And, and, and this is the main um, concept or the main point of this chapter is about humility. And from verse 5 to verse um, 11, simple introduces to us one of the early hymns or doxologies in the church that was about Christ. And we recited parts of it in, the, in, in Good Friday. He says that, let this mind be in you. Let this way of thinking be in you. If, if you want to have joy, think this way which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. So he's saying that, think like Christ, being already God. For Christ, the second person of the Holy Trinity, being divine is not, is not something that he obtained or he seized from someone else. By nature, he is God. He didn't take it from someone. That he didn't take it as, as a robbery. He didn't seize it. Now I am God. No, he is from the beginning. Before the beginning of the ages, he is God. So, taking the form of a servant, taking the form of human people, was not something that undermined him or underestimated him because he was already rich in and by himself. but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of, of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of, the, of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Um, this cycle
Now I will apply it on myself. I want to have this mind of Christ that knowing my value in God, knowing my, my worth as His likeness and His image and His child, being humble or thinking of other people or doing acts of mercy and service will not take away from me anything. Matter of fact, I will be exalted in the eyes of God because I am resembling, I am doing like Him, I am acting like Him. I am following the example of Christ, being of a high stature as God or in uh, uh, um, divine nature, He emptied Himself. So joy really doesn't come from acquiring things or hearing good things about me or people serving me or doing things for me, but joy is getting out of myself, emptying yourself, doing acts of love and mercy. We, we hear many stories and uh, many stories about people who maybe go to mission trips in Africa or in Mexico or in Bolivia, or even people who go to the homeless here and feed them and make food for them and serve them, they feel different. They feel joy. They feel free. Because you know what? When you go to those impoverished uh, people or mission trips in uh, Kenya or uh, Zimbabwe or any African country or even the poor neighborhood here in America, you stop thinking about yourself for a while. And it is nice, right? <laughs> you stop thinking about yourself and you go to other people and you feel that, you know what, it is nice. It is really, there is something different. I am contributing, I am giving something. And you start to appreciate the beauty of life and the basics of life. When you're so stuck in yourself and about yourself and about the next iPad 3 that you're missing and you still have iPad 1 and how miserable you are having an old iOS system <laughs> or you need to get the next droid, you're, you're really stuck in yourself and you're not happy and you'll never be happy. But when you go out and you see people who are like you, human being like you, and just appreciate a piece of bread that you give them. You say, wow, life really has more meaning than, being, than upgrading to the next gadget. So, emptying yourself, going out of yourself, will help you rejoice because you will be free from yourself, like Christ. And the end, as God exalted Christ and every knee sh shall bow in heaven and earth, you also will know your value in Christ and God will reward you. You will live a life that God rewards. Yes, God rewards those who labor for Him. Maybe um, different kind of rewards. I don't know, but this is another topic. But yes, God rewards a life that is living out of itself. In verse 12, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and, and 
generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. How come a life of joy goes with working out my salvation in fear and trembling? To us, fear and trembling really doesn't equal joy. But working out or living out my salvation gives me joy because it is the most valuable treasure. When you have this, imagine you have this diamond, this beautiful diamond, big diamond. Would you just put it in your drawer and leave home to the cleaning lady or to any workers, in construction workers in your house? No, because it is like so valuable, so valuable. No money can replace it. You take it with you or you wear it or you put it in the bank in a safety deposit box or you make every effort to keep it. This is the fear, the, this is the fear and trembling part. You are so careful, you're so cautious to not let it go. Why? Because salvation is really the most valuable treasures that we have been given. We have been given the gift of salvation. Don't waste it. Don't let anybody take it away from you. When you appreciate what you have been given by God, you will know your value and you will rejoice. But if salvation is, okay, I read in the book that God came, He was born in a manger, nice lights, nice tree, nice gifts, and then after three, two or three months, yeah, we put him on the cross, then we, and we have Easter, we go to Easter egg hunt, it's nice, we eat mahshi, kofta, makarona, right? And yeah, that's nice, good, we went to church. Would you really understand the gift of redemption and salvation? This is not salvation. This is not. If I am not saved in Christ and accepting the gift of salvation personally and transforming, and transforming my life, and my life is centered about and for and in Christ, I don't understand anything. So joy also comes from appreciating the gift of, of salvation. Knowing, again, going back to chapter 1, knowing whom I believe. Knowing whom I believe. So if, if you're seeking happiness outside, good luck. But if you're seeking um, consistent joy, consistent understanding of life, Come and seek it, and you'll find it. Joy is not like what the world says. Joy comes from being in Christ, being living the way I have been created for. We all search for meanings in life. We all search for my reason to live. And certainly, your reason, your reason to live is not just to go to school, graduate, get a high-paying job, get married, having kids, and, and then die. This is not a life. It is stages. <laughs> but the real life is having meaning in all of these stages, knowing why you're doing what, uh, what you're doing. But if you're just walking because everybody's walking, 
and you don't know where you're going or why you're walking, but it feels good because I'm walking like everybody else. This is not joy. It is maybe conformity 